Patriarchal domination depends on the silencing of women. We're going to look at patterns of control over women's speech, especially public speech. Go back all the way to ancient Sumeria and the laws of Urukagina. If a woman speaks disrespectfully to a man, that woman's mouth is crushed with a fired brick. And they display that brick at the city gate. And they add also that in former times, women were more free. The Babylonians had a handbook of sorcery called Maklu, burning. And it portrays the witch as someone who accuses someone in court. They say victim, but for a woman to speak about any harm to her is considered a wrong thing. And she is sentenced and burned herself. Burn, set a light, incinerate my witch. And may her life come quickly to an end. And you see the reference here in this scholar is talking about the fierce false tongue of the witch and her demonization. So this is something we can track back very early in time in the early patriarchies, this patriarchal dynamic. There are other kinds of behavioral spatial subordinations of women. And the mouth fail is something that we see in ancient Greece. So considered indecent for her to show her mouth in public but this is also very close resonating with the idea of a gag and we see this also showing up in southwest asia here in an uh, example in syria and also the wimple which the huns had wimples and there are various eurasian forms of the wimple doesn't always cover the the mouth in this way but here it does in this swiss example and then you also have the mouth veil showing up in Armenia, not so far really from Syria. The Armenian refugees ended up there. We also see lip plates in Northeastern Africa, and they prevent speech. Wives must wear them in the presence of their husbands and their in-laws. And there is a higher value set on women that have very big lip plates. So you cannot, you cannot talk while these are in. Now, instances like this really conflict with the pattern that women in indigenous societies, generally speaking, have more right to speak than those in the feudal, capitalist, and imperial societies. But we do find references to taboos on women speaking in public assemblies in some indigenous societies, maybe a minority. Uh, in Southern Ethiopia, Borana men exclude women from the council meetings. But women make sure to voice their opinions by singing work songs that satirize or directly criticize some unjust or unwise decision the men are contemplating. This against the, the primary indigenous pattern that I find in my research is of women's right not only to speak, but to have a decisive voice in decision making and diplomacy and a whole variety of public spheres. And this is indicated a theme here by the Cherokee painter, Dorothy Sullivan. She speaks for her clan. But going back to Europe for a moment, the Greeks and the Romans both had taboos against women's speech and um, even being in public in some cases. So in, in patrician Rome, the ladies had to observe restraint in speech, act, and gaze. So they were supposed to look down, not look directly at men. They were not to speak in public. And Roman women writers are pretty thin on the ground too. These Roman imperial period conventions, which were part of, part of West Asia, a lot of parts of the world already had a high degree of patriarchy, but you see some of this being reflected in the Christian Bible. So you've got the famous dictum, women should remain silent in churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. That's Corinthians, but look at this. There's an earlier verse before this one that contradicts that, and it says women should cover their heads when they prophesy, which is not prediction, as we might con conclude from that word, but meaning preaching. So there were women preaching. We've got evidence of that from early Christian texts. So there is a mixed tradition there. But some books, and this is this is what they call a pseudo-Pauline scripture, 1 Timothy, they don't think it was really written by Paul, 
I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. So you've got this idea of retiring women who keep silent and you know, allow men to take the, the leadership, uh, something that is showing up in actually most pa the patriarchal religions. That's That's the rule with exceptions. Now, if we look at later Christian history, we see the synod of, of, of con condemnation of Paul of Samosata. One of the charges against him was he allowed women to sing in church. Pope Leo in the ninth century forbade female choirs to sing in Catholic churches. And there's a lot of these. I don't have a whole list here of it, just some examples. Well, here's another one in early Frankish uh, synod of Auxerre prohibiting, prohibiting girls to sing. And then again, another sign of uh, St. Boniface, and this is a missionary in Germany in the 8th century, forbade women to sing in church. And then just to show you how long lasting these strictures are, here's one from 1907. Women should be not be part of a choir. Separate women's choirs, too, are totally forbidden. Catholic hierarchy. Now we also have... These kinds of claims being made in Islamic contexts, this is a headline somewhere. This is not a universal claim, but there's a very strong position, which was not the case in the time of Muhammad, but calling women's voice aura, which means shameful. Uh, she may become a cause of disorder, so she must speak only in need and in a straight voice, meaning not softly or what they would see as being seductively. And so there's a, a, dis, a dispute about this that's been going on for some time inside Islam. And so some authorities say women's voices should never be heard in public. Others, well, under certain conditions, maybe you can do it. But in the Hambali school, it is called makruh, which is detestable to listen to women's voices unless necessary. And there are Orthodox Judaic sects also that uh, have those same kinds of rules that it would be too tempting to men and therefore women should remain silent, not sing, not pray to, so that they can be heard by men. And so uh, here's an example. So these are the extremists and you've got this particular sheikh saying women cannot give a sermon or lead salah or even on the hajj, she's supposed to keep her voice low so only the person next to her can hear it and men around her are not supposed to listen to this. Nevertheless, we have traditions in different Islamic countries, and in Egypt especially, there were women hafiza who memorized the entire Quran and would chant it. A lot of them were blind women, like Sakina Hassan, and she was very well known. She was actually eventually forced to cease this because of fatwas that happened somewhere in uh, around 1940, banning women's voice as aura, as shameful. And she had to move on to popular music because of those restraints being lowered on. And so then if also we go over to China, the Confucians had the doctrine of the four, virtu four virtues. And so one of these is women's speech. They're along with behavior, the work, and morality, which is different than the morality that was prescribed for men. And so we see in the Book of Rights up a, a recommendation that the bride-to-be must undergo a three-month intensive training as an obedient wife. And that includes ways of controlling her speech because the claim was that women's speech would subvert the social order. And the proverb says, an eloquent woman will overwhelm the country. So they see women's speech as dang dangerous and they want to control it. And women must speak appropriately. And this all fits in with the Confucian code of the three obediences. And it defines women as indoor people and men as outdoor people. Therefore, the public realm is male and excludes women. And we see customary that isn't necessarily always written down. Customary restraints on speech from girlhood. And Tsering Yang Ke here talks about how shyness is encoded uh, through socialization of girls and how her mother literally discouraged me, a young girl, from talking too much. 
She used to tell me or rather lecture me that a girl should be as quiet as a mute, but a boy should not be quite as crazy as a madman. So they can kind of run wild. But uh, this brought a lot of um, reluctance to speak later in life, Low, lack of confidence in speaking. And we see it, there's a lot of testimony of this all over the world. I don't have a lot, say, from the Arab world or, you know, India or places where, you know, I don't speak the language. But here is Rebecca Lolo Soli, who is an important activist uh, in the Samburu community in Kenya. And she says, you aren't allowed to answer men or speak in front of them, whether you are right or wrong. That has to change. So she is speaking out and organizing women to have self-determination. And uh, nearby Uganda also, Miria Matembe, this is an earlier photo from her. I think this might've been the 80s or the 90, 90s when she's calling herself big mouth feminist. But as you can see, she went on to the parliament of Uganda. She was on the constitutional commission, Pan-African parliament. She's done all this stuff and women's rights is right there in the center of her activism. But then we have Mary Beard here saying that when it comes to silencing women, Western culture has had thousands of years of practice. And I alluded earlier to the Greeks and the Romans, which are just two examples. But here we've got a witch judge, uh, not from the church, a secular judge in France, Nicolas Rémy. Whoever wants to tie, tie the devil's arms, it will be necessary to take women out of the world. Very, very severe repression of women in the European witch hunts. So I want to look at this and allied patterns of repression that went on, not just at the height of the witch craze, but over a longer period of time, really over a millennium that I've been able to document. And so women are often accused based on their speech, especially if they retort angrily, uh, especially speaking to men, especially older women, and they're being blamed for all the misfortunes that can happen in life, whether it's disease or injuries or bad harvests, any kind of unwanted event can be turned onto the witch, the accused woman as a scapegoat. And the core accusation was that the woman was able by the power of her evil thoughts or spells to magically cause harm to others and even their deaths from a remote distance. And this accusation is a justification then that the witch is a threat to the community and therefore she deserves to be shunned, attacked, beaten, tortured, or killed. And this could happen in a formal trial, and it did in many, many instances, or extrajudicially in a lynching. And this is something that the all-male public authorities tolerated. I have an article about this. I'll try to remember to put that in the, in the program notes. So you've got the mythology of Athamas murdering his wife and children, but it is a witch's fault. And you can see her there causing him to kill his family uh, there with the dragons in her hands. So this blaming of the witch for misfortunes, again, is this, this underlying pattern. And we get to the point at the height of the witch hunts in France, where Alda Gondaru says, but hey, they say all women are witches. And this is this is something that the male demonologist said, but this is also her observation of the social conditions under which these accusations were spreading. And with them, women being sent to the state. Uh, overall in Europe, 80% or more of those targeted and executed were female. And some of the males who were targeted, there are many reasons, as well, like, you know, they could have been gay, they could have been trans, they could have been various different things, uh, foreigners, disabled, old, many, many reasons. But in some cases, they were related to women who had been, been burned. So their association with a targeted woman was a factor. And this repression went on for centuries. So they read out charges at the stake and would offer her an easier death if she would confirm the accusations extracted from her under torture in front of the avid crowd. And these were pornographic in most cases. So um, these were public spectacles in which women were martyred in front of mobs of people who came to watch this. And the prelude, of course, to the execution was the torture trial. This is something that was authorized, reauthorized out of Greek and Roman 
tradition by the Catholic Church in the early 13th century. And the Inquisition begins to spread judicial torture, not that it had never happened before, but again, institutionally placing it as a permitted thing. And the torture's purpose, aside from just expressing pure hatred toward women, was to coerce her speech and to extort a confession, to force her to say what the torturers and the judges demanded that she should say, and also to denounce others and extract information that could be used to accuse others. And this is how these hunts snowballed into mass persecutions. They were not above using relatives to try and extract uh, the confession. And we always put that in quotes because this is all coercive. And what the historian Henry Charles Lee called the unfailing witch chair, which was using iron and fire to uh, torture a woman into agreeing to the confession, quote, that they wanted. And even with this, there were cases of old women who held out and never confessed. They just, they just endured until they were killed by it. And so the lesson of all of this is that women learned they had to hold their tongues. And most of all, when they were being wrong, it was dangerous for women to speak. And over and over, female speech was presented in court as proof of magical harm, especially for talking back to men, although there were also female accusers in these hunts. We see in the iconography, this is a, a frontispiece from an early edition of the Malleus Maleficarum, that God the Father and Son presiding above in glory and then down below, the degraded witch who is naked, being tortured by devils with ropes around her neck and pointing defiantly at her tongue. So her speech is somehow the core of her diabolical nature. Now, the trials are one thing, but there was also various ways of persecuting a witch within the community. And in England and Scotland, they called this, well, in Scotland, the name for it was scoring a boon the breath. So cutting above her mouth. And the idea was that the attacker in drawing her blood would break any spells that he thought she had cast. And so there are examples of this in Scotland, but we also see trials in England. And this is a record of that where you have two couples waylaying this woman on her way to the market and rending her fle flesh with brambles. Uh, assaulting her, thrust, thrusting pins in her body and leg, but to rend and tear her flesh. And they came for her blood and they would have it. So the idea of drawing her blood somehow, a belief that that would end whatever harm they believed she had done. And so we see in court records as late as the 1700s or even the 1800s in Scotland, scoring a witch, an invaluable method to disappoint her enchantments. And we have this case in 1814, a shepherd dissatisfied with the quantity of milk from his cows, thought that this was caused by an old woman living 15 miles away. And he decided to do scoring a boon the brith and uh, set out, found her and cut her severely in the brow. So these are recorded cases, which is really the tip of the iceberg. Now I wanna look at other forms of control so we've got like direct violence as forms of intimidation. But there are also the witch's bridle or the scold's bridle, which were actual gags, metal gags that were placed over a woman's mouth. And not only over it, but in it, there were tabs often with spikes that would hold her tongue down. So she literally could not speak as she was strapped into this head cage. And they're mostly metal. You'll see some leather straps on some of them as well. So these are both instruments of humiliation, but also of punishment, public punishment. She could be paraded through the streets. Children could throw things at her. People could throw garbage, um, revile her, strike her. She would be made to stand out, maybe in front of her house, maybe in front of the church or some other public place. And so the scold's bridle, of course, refers to women's speech very directly, which is bridal, but branks means a bridle. And all of these refer to a bit for restraining a horse 
or a fetter. And so there's a very clear idea of bondage as if she was an animal, but specifically targeting her ability to speak. And you will see prongs and, and uh, spikes on some of these as they're forced over her head and this, this twang stuck into her tang, stuck into her mouth, sometimes heated. So the punishment is multiple. She could have uh, effects much afterwards. And this cage for her head actually has a door to it. And some of them were actually instruments of torture. This one was equipped with a head vice that could be tightened so that her skull would be squeezed by it. Still has the bridle there. This looks like leather to me. And we have men driving women in witches' bridles through the streets to be hounded and harassed by the populace and, and you know humiliated in front of the entire community. And the same practice also in Germany, although without the bridal, but whipping the attacked woman through the streets in order to humiliate her. And that was what the Schanmasken were, shame masks. Now, they were applied to men as well, but there were particular masks that usually involved extended tongues, asses, ears, the idea that speech in particular is targeted. And here you've got the woman also in the stocks and children are, you know, torturing them. Uh, but the Schanmasken often take the form of animal faces. Here's another one with the asses, ears, and the long tongue. And these are also found in Germany, I mean, in Austria. The Puritans brought these methods of oppression to New England, and that would include scold ducking, which I'm about to come to. But a scold, of course, refers to a woman who reproaches a man for any reason. I mean, it may be that he drank up all the family's money or beat her or the children or in any number of things that he did wrong. She's not allowed to talk back because these are the punishments they want to impose. In the Americas, slaveholders adapted the branks to repress captive Africans, especially in Brazil and the West Indies. These were also fine in, in North America. Uh, but so a combination of silencing, restraint, dehuman, dehumanization, you've got the chains and the, the shackles also brought into the picture. And in Brazil, there was a legend of Escrava Anastasia, the enslaved Anastasia, who was a healer saint who went torments by the slaveholders involving these gags. And she becomes an uh, important saint in the Umbanda religion. And the slaveholder is punishing her with the gag and iron collar for helping people escape slavery or for resisting sexual assault or even both. So this is something, this, this story has been remembered among people in modern Brazil. Anyhow, there's a lot of different sketches and revisualizations. There are very few pictures of this being done in that time period. But um, that's that's the witch's bridal. And what's really interesting is to see the very tight similarity between the bridal placed on the witch and the ball gag that's used in porn in the second half of the 20th century. And so this, this silencing, shaming, repression, repression is also uh, carried out inside of porn culture. Then one more kind of both torture and humiliation, swimming a witch or ducking the scold. And this is using water as an orde ordeal. So in the Germanic world, you had the witch's bath that is shown in uh, women being pushed underwater as an ordeal to determine and it was really a catch-22. If she floated, she was guilty. If she sank and maybe drowned, then she was innocent. So you really couldn't win. And so there's quite old, or early medieval examples of the water ordeal in Europe, or even older in Mesopotamia. And here is the swimming of a witch by all men with her uh, black sow there uh, coming to her rescue or wanting to in Britain. And these were, again, sometimes executions. So Ruth Osborne, they stripped her, they hogtied her. She had muttered angrily because someone refused to give her alms of buttermilk. 
and you've got this all male mob with staves and they throw her into the pond. There's her husband. He was attacked too, but he was allowed to live. He didn't go through this process of drowning. So, you know, this was supposed to be ducking the witch, but actually um, they're executing her and she dies. But there's also ducking the, sto the scold. And so the, the witch ducking is more of an ordeal, supposedly to prove guilt or innocent. Ducking the scold is purely a punishment of female speech. And it is a kind of torture. She too could be drowned, like happened to Ruth Osborne. And it's predominantly carried out by men. They actually had these, these uh, mechanisms to lower her into the pond or the river or sometimes the filthy canal where sewage is floating. And so this is from the 1600s. And this is a practice we see a lot in England. And you see resistance also here in this drawing. Because after all, these are the most defiant women in the society. And there you've got a special chair that's forged with the iron with a little place where it can be hooked and lowered into the water. This is also carried over into New England. And see here, they were gagged and set by their own doors for all comers and goers to gaze at. And these duckings went on in Britain all the way to the end of the 1800s. This is at Newport, Wales. And so outspoken women are targeted there. There are elements of this also going on in the Spanish Inquisition as far as who is targeted as a witch. The number of witch burnings is much lower in Spain because they were much more concerned about repressing the Moors and the Jews. But um, there were some witch burnings. What was more sort of under the radar of a lot of people who think about this history is that there was a lot, there was like a cultural repression that was carried out by inquisitors of hectoring women, especially old women, as you see here, and forcing them to quote unquote confess to whether it was witchcraft or some other forbidden activity. And public humiliation and imprisonment were still going on. So you might not be executed, although being in a dungeon could be a death sentence. But the Inquisition in Spain did not end until 1820. And so this is a very long going process. And even after these trials and burnings of witches stopped, social shunning, harassment, and sometimes violence continued to go on in the villages. It had spread and so here, this is a, a drawing from the 1930s showing boys stoning an old Basque woman who was thought to be a witch. And you see the woman just looking on. She's not doing anything to help her. Now, there's another side piece to this with all of the demonology that was part of the witch dog dogma. And that is possession and exorcism. And possession is a woman who is out of control. She may be shouting things, sometimes sexual things. There are ways in which sexual abuse, especially in the convents, surfaces through possession. And there are a whole range of behaviors and cultural rituals that are intended to bring the woman back under control. And so you've got the scenes of the priest exercising the woman. You see devils emerging out of her mouth. And again and again, this is the theme, the idea that somehow, again, her speech is wrong. The devils are inside of her and must be made to come out by dominating her ceremonially. And sometimes they're grabbing her by the breasts. And there are public exorcisms that go on in France and Belgium in the late 1800s, early 1600s of women in convents who were possessed and bound like a slave in the friar's hand, and he actually stands on her breast and throat. There's a physical domination going on in these exorcisms. And so here, one of these convent outbreaks, and they were public spectacles. So huge crowds would come to see the priest dominate the woman, and again, the devil's coming out of her mouth. In some of the cases, like, for example, I think at Loudon, there it was very strong indicators of sexual abuse by one of the priests. And what is going on here too is that these women in the convents are literally behind bars. 
Many of them were not there voluntarily. They were put there by their aristocratic family. She had no say about it. And they might pull her back out for a marriage or she might be stuck there for life behind those high walls. Exorcism goes on in other cultures too. And here's an example of rebellious wife in India is considered to be possessed. And so you've got a female torturer here, in this case, the exorcist professional, and helped by the brother-in-law who is torturing her by squeezing her fingernails. And that's a well-known form of, of very painful torture. We also see evangelical younger men attacking women elders among the Guarani Cayua people. This is in a process of colonization by uh, Christian Protestant cults, which are, these women were representatives of the old spirits in their culture. And you see the man holding her, dominating her by the head, threatening her with a machete in his hand. And so there's, there's no way that she can really fight back. And so um, this is to impose Christian doctrine on the Guarani people. They are the guardians of their culture and religion and accused of witchcraft in this context. And we can see some of that colonial witch hunting being spilling over also into in the Haudenosaunee world, the six nations of the Iroquois, among the Seneca at least. There, this is from a Seneca artist, persecutions of women as witches. This is in a period where um, it's a colonial time and there's a Christian influence and also pushback against Christian influence happening at that time. So they're flogging women. And then you've got your evangelical exorcists, which are all over the place in the United States. And again, the male female dominant uh, dynamic is very uh, pronounced there as it is also in Muslim contexts. This is in the island of Réunion in the Indian Ocean and screaming outbreaks among schoolgirls. This is very similar. The confined women, at like we had saw with the convent outbreaks and there's trauma, there's pain, there is distress. And this has to be brought according to patriarchal norms under control. We see this also in the UK and this imam does television exorcisms of women. And you can see, you know, the browbeating that's going on there, uh, all with the, you know, it's the, the microphone and he's telling her what she would do. Again, easily angered and would scream for no reason, according to him. So they think she's possessed by evil spirits and again, has to be brought back to heal through the exorcism. There's one more thing about this possession, though, which is that in the witch hunts, often you have subordinate servant girls who are young and maybe living out. They're not even with their own family. And they are venting out their distress through possessions in which they accuse adult women. And they're saying, oh, goody stone. She sent the, I see the, the little yellow bird sitting up there on the rafters. And, you know, she's, she's telling them to prick me with pins, whatever the accusation were. So these were, again, theaters of domination. And so the women are being, uh, actually were being hanged uh, by the all-male Puritan juries on the basis of accusations by these distressed girls. And so a theater of accusation and using spectral evidence of magical harm that witches caused from afar. They didn't have to be in the same room. They didn't have to touch the person, but the accusation was that this is what witches do. And not all these women went along with it. So Martha Corey, she defies the Puritan officials. They hang her, of course, but she's not having it. And we don't know all the stories of what went on inside these trials or inside the dungeons. But uh, there were certainly women who stood up to the witch judges and were defiant to them. But I want to talk about another form of female speech, which is a written or embroidered document and from these same Salem witch trials in 1692. Mary Eastie wrote out this petition to the judges and she knew they weren't going to let her go, but she wanted no more innocent blood to be shed, which cannot be avoided in the way and course you go in. But by my own innocency, I know you are in the wrong way. Of course, they didn't listen to her. 
So a lot of times women didn't have pen and paper, but they could get a hold of rags and they could unravel them and make thread. And Mette Charlotte Falk in Sweden lost four members of her family to an epidemic and then was accused of having killed them either through witchcraft, because this is right after the witch hunts ended in, in Sweden, or by some other means. And so over months, she painstakingly embroidered her petition to the judges on rags in prison, pleading to the judges, and they executed her anyway. These embroideries are really interesting testimony about women you do, would not normally hear anything about. Elizabeth Parker was a serving girl who survived a rape attempt by her master in 1830. And this is the document she created. I went to Fairlight Housemate to Lieutenant G. And their cruel usage soon made me curse my disobedience to my parents. But they treated me with cruelty too horrible to mention for trying to avoid the wicked design of my master. Guess what's going on there? I was thrown downstairs. And she manages to get out of that she manages to get out of that household and take up service in another home. But the mistress there, who is probably sympathetic, uh, calls in a doctor and he begins to browbeat her as a sinner. And so you see also some of the verses that she's embroidered talking about her wickedness that he had tried to convince her was all somehow her fault. And there, there's another really amazing set of documents, very long embroidered banners created by Lorena Bulwer, who was confined in a madhouse after having been in workhouses where women were being trafficked, both in the workhouse and also into brothels. And so she tells stories of sexual abuse and she names names, people, places, where the brothels were, I was brought into this Charlotte Street brothel workhouse, so she's not even making a distinction there, and she's naming the perpetrators. So she's in a madhouse, you know, she, you, you, you cannot <laughs> say these things. And these samplers that she created, or these banners, I guess I could call them, 10, 14, 16 feet long, because what else did she have to do there? So she just sewed the whole thing. Another woman imprisoned in a madhouse in the turn of the last century and from early 1900s, Agnes Richter in Germany, and she embroidered her words on a jacket that she had made. Another woman, Merlin in Tennessee, confined in a madhouse and worked in a laundry. So she would gather cloth and lint and she used it to embroider coats with a whole range of cryptic words and images. And so, you know, it's very hard to, to make some of this out, but you've got a woman here dressed in a garter belt, tassels and everything. And this is the only coat that survives out of several that she created. She was subjected to electroshock. And after that, she made no more coats. So they considered that a cure. Here's another example of wife of a Jacobite rebel defiantly memorializes her husband who was beheaded for treason in 1716 and she embroidered his linen sheet from the tower with her hair in protest. Then we have a woman in the early 1900s named Ruth, 1921, bearing witness to her great grandmother's love under the unbearable conditions of slavery. Rose gave this flower sack to her daughter, Ashley, when slaveholders sold her off at the age of nine. And so long, long after that, the family kept and cherished this sack that just had a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans and a braid of the mother's hair. And it is filled with her love always. She never saw her again. So in 1921, Ruth embroidered the story of her great-grandmother on this actual heirloom, the only connection to her ancestor. And here's something else. This is a petition from women in the U.S., white women, probably middle-class women. They're able to write. They're bowing to male authority, so they admit 
in order to please, to placate the men they're trying to convince that, you know, we don't presume to direct your contact, but we have a duty to advise and persuade you. So this is a protest against injury and oppression of a hapless people, meaning native people inside the United States. We, the feeblest of the feeble, please, you know, don't, don't think we're bad. We're trying to, to make you think that, you know, we're not threatening and implore you to give them help. And despite of the undoubted natural right, which the Indians have to their land and in the face of solemn treaties, the government is forcing them from their native soil. We solemnly appeal to save this remnant of a much injured people from annihilation. So that's a rare document. But if a woman did not comply and she could end up jailed just as well as in, in a madhouse, if she spoke out or protested, she could be published publicly, punished publicly with humiliation, shunning and violence, or they could just deep six her into the hole. But women's acts of speech commonly are what led to them being imprisoned in the madhouses. And here's an example from France. This is kind of a sanitized view from a male artist that visit, visited the notorious Salpêtrière in Paris. And a lot of these women are social outsiders. They Once they're in those places, there's the witnesses are the staff there. They're, they're, they're not going to do anything to stop it. They're the perpetrators in most, most cases. And everything that goes on against them, including rapes and tortures, are completely out of view of society. They have no defenders. One of these women, her husband was a minister, and he committed her to a mental institution because she disagreed with his doctrine. And not only that, she spoke to others about her own beliefs. So he gets her locked up, and after years and years, she eventually won, wins her release, and she goes around with the mission to get lawmakers to pass laws to protect wives against this form of abuse, this, this use of husband's absolute authority. And there are all kinds of crazy reasons for admission, for women being confined in these mental prisons, including novel reading or studying religion, um, lesbianism, all kinds of different things. But these so-called asylums were places where the psychiatrist replaces the inquisitor and restraint chairs, the witch's chair. And the women, and there's a very large proportion of women in these places, are subjected to electroshock, ice baths, insulin shock treatments. These are all historically going on in the early 20th century. Also radiation treatments or being immobilized with wet blankets, lobotomies, which were considered a great new medical uh, invention, were going on in the 20th century as late as the 80s. And again, women who did not conform or obey, and a lot of lesbians, I know personally lesbians, that were locked up for their sexual orientation. But traumatized, poor, disabled women and girls orphans, all kinds of socially marginalized women could have this done to them. Now, I want to turn from that to more recent, uh, well, it's not more recent, but uh, the backlash against the women's rights movement. And there's a lot of postcards that became popular around the turn of the 1900s, where you've got gagging, bridling, or cutting of tongues of women. And so here you've got the gagging of Maria Cano, who was a Colombian labor activist. And it's labeled here as the great remedy. So at bayonet point and gagged, and you've got the forces of the state. And also this is supposed to be the capitalist Lord, I suppose. Um, but silencing women in national liberation movements, suffragists, labor movements, and some of these directly invoke the suffragists. They should be bound and gagged. And so there are variations here on the witch's bridles that are being directly invoked. Also ducking. So this postcard again here for a suffragette, the ducking school, stool and a nice deep pool was our forefathers plan for a scold. And could I have my way, each suffragette today should take the chair and find the water cold. 
So here's an English ducking. They're saying the last ducking, although that Welsh example is, is later. Uh, Jenny Pipes paraded through Leominster, strapped to a chair with irons and lowered into the water off the bridge. And she was accused of speaking ill of her husband once too often. So there's loads of these, and some of them really are the witches' bridles, but also you'll get tongues being tortured. And, you know, the women are just made to look ridiculous. There's no sympathy for them. But again, beware of suffragists. And so cutting the tongue, just like we saw in the Malleus Maleficarum, the tongue is the evil part. In fact, she even has the ropes around the neck, the same as that frontispiece I showed. Of suffragists or of wives, here you've got the the pulling out through the rollers of the tongue of the woman. And this is a theme that also shows up in Slovenia. There was folk paintings that were made on beehives. And this is a whole, a whole theme that happens of devils causing a woman, forcing her to sharpen her tongue on a grinding stone. And there's a bunch of these. You can see the dates there. Also the whole theme of black devils, which is also tied in with um, demonization of blackness in the witch hunts. These are all legacies of, of that demonology. So sharpening the woman's tongue or sawing her in half. And then much more recent memes of, you know, this is supposed to be funny, uh, the, the anti-nag gag. So this is husband to wife for telling him to just do what he's supposed to do. And so... Physical force and verbal abuse are both brought to bear to punish women and force women into silence, and at least outwardly to comply. And these kinds of violence enjoy a very high level of impunity, violence against women, from the police, judges, courts, public authorities, whether or not the aggression is public or private. And so intimidation of women is always enhanced by this background threat of violence, women know very well they're at risk. So here you have a woman who just simply said no to a strange man that asked her for her phone number and he smashed her face with a brick. And everybody, all the boys, all the young men standing around, no, nothing, nobody did anything to stop him. They just stood there and watched. Nobody even called an ambulance for her. And so you see this theme of a man's hand over a woman's mouth. This is an example from Pakistan. There's actually a, a TV drama series called Chupraho, Be Quiet. And you see this theme also racialized silencing of Black women. So misogynoir silencing. You see it in a colonial context of the Chinese government against the Uyghurs in Central Asia. And this is a protester with the, the red hand over her mouth and the Islamic star and, and crescent showing her identity. She can't show her face because it's very, very dangerous. And there again, torture is being used to uh, keep them silent. The Bolivian miners' strike, this is in the mid 20th century, Domitila Barrios titled her autobiography, Let Me Speak. And this was, you know, they were oppressed on the basis of class, but you also have women having to fight their own men to get them to, you know, allow them to participate in the, the community struggle for liberation, something that also happens in uh, Salt of the Earth. But also there's another method of, besides direct violence, open repression, and that is to elevate women who admire and side with male power and domination. And so I call this men's words and women's mouth. This is something that uh, uh, Lefkowitz and Font came up with uh, in their study of Roman women. And this is really an indispensable strategy to patriarchal and colonial domination. It's a cultural form of control. And if you can get a woman to voice the patriarchal dogma, they will elevate her because that's what they want to hear. They want women to take that in and they, you know, hear, hear another woman saying it. It's like that proverb about the trees see the axe and they see the wooden handle and say, look, the axe is one of us. 
So again, the Confucian doctrine, this is Ban Zhao, who was a learned woman, who is speaking to other women. And the text is translated differently, but lessons for women, instructions for women. And so women have to choose their words with care, no vulgar language, speak at appropriate times, which a lot of times is never, and not to worry, worry others with much conversation. So really don't talk too much. Obey. Do not think of opposing or discussing what is, what is not. You must, your, your place is to follow your husband and do as he wants. We see in Greek plays, for example, the Eumenides of Aeschylus, using Athena as the mouthpiece of patriarchy. And she exonerates a, a matricidal son saying, there's no mother anywhere who gave me birth, but I am always for the male and strongly on my father's side. So when a case where the wife has killed her husband, her death shall not mean most to me, even though that husband had killed her daughter and you know other terrible things. These are men's words in women's mouths. And we see this a lot in literature. Uh, some of the texts that were attributed to Pythagorean women, uh, one attributed to a woman called Fintis on correct female behavior, emphasizes chastity, modesty, fidelity, and praises women who, you know, their sons are legitimate from their fathers. But these texts are forgeries because the style and language show they were written centuries later than the women whose names they use. And so Mary Lefkowitz and Maureen Fant describe these prescriptions as men's words in women's mouths. And it's a very useful tool or, uh, or phrase to be able to name this dynamic. Because we saw this with Phyllis Schlafly, who you know went up against women's rights. There are current iterations of, of her advocacy. You know, women should stay home and be housewives, except guess what? She did not. She became a big public figure in uh, the service of empire as well as her fight against the ERA. And then we have Camille Paglia, who claims that all great culture comes out of men's violence. That's really, really great. Um, big defender of Western Sid and the Rolling Stones. So um, this is another scholar who wrote the book you see there. And she encountered the word matriarchy and a male archaeologist suggested Crete had been matriarchal and got a really negative response. And so she said, wrote, she actually admits this, if a lot of mockery was all that prehistoric matriarchies could get me, who needed them? And this was part of a larger pattern of ridicule and attacks on Maria Gimbutas and other scholars. And so, you know, she got, like Paglia, major coverage in the news weeklies and, and the media because this is what men wanted to hear. So the point we're at now, uh, the controls, there's the, the, the situation has changed ideologically a lot in the last 25 years to the point where in academia, especially to name sex and oppression of the female sex is treated as offensive and even as literal violence. And it merits social punishment, exclusion, or even violent retribution. So this takes us back to women's oppression being unspeakable because if there's no sex, then guess what? There's no sexism, nothing to see here. Let's move on. And this negates the entire cultural edifice of patriarchy, which is controlling women, colonizing women's bodies for sex, reproduction, unpaid labor, and personal servitude. It's not that our sex is the problem, it's structural exploitation of the female sex, instrumentation of women's bodies. And this is the foundation upon which feudalism, capitalism, and empire depend it's their necessary precondition. Turns out women's work matters very much. But we see in the modern world where so much has supposedly changed that women's voices are often discounted in public affairs. They speak less, are more subject to negative interruptions, and they are at a disadvantage speaking as women in all kinds of contexts in different parts of the world, including in the media and the news sites, 
uh, you know, who gets to be the newsreader, who gets to do the editorial commentary, even on women's issues. You have like, you know, men talking about abortion rights and where policy is discussed and decisions made, women take up just a quarter to a third of discussion time, unless they're in the majority. It's a big if. And Dale Spender in Australia did a study of university classroom discussions, and she found that men always talk the most and for long, longer. But she went further, and she actually asked the students to estimate who talked more in the discussion. Women had a pretty good idea, but men perceived the discussion as being equal when women talked only 15% of the time. And they thought women were dominating the discussion when they spoke only 30% of the time. They couldn't even get to 50% before it was already considered to be too much. And then we have the journalists and the amazing Anna Politkovskaya, who was assassinated after many death threats for reporting on the Russian atrocities in Chechnya. Uh, women journalists are very much targets, not to say no male journalists are, but this is very much of a pattern. Uh, here we've got one study that says 73% of women journalists experienced a form of online violence. Iran is persecuting Nilofar Hamadi and Elahi Mohammadi for reporting on the killing of Masa Jina Amine in state custody. Here is Gauri Lankesh, also murdered in 2017 for reporting on Hindu fundamentalist violence. And of course, all of us know the way that social media treats women and the rape threats and the sexual insults and stalking and doxing and sometimes forcing women to change their accounts or even their place of residence. Uh, so severe is that attack on women for daring to say something in a public sphere. This applies also even to women in parliaments. And so in 2018, half of the female MPs had received death or rape threats, a quarter sexual violence. Nearly 15% were physically attacked, but 82% had been verbally abused. And we can see examples of that also in the United States, in UK, different places. This uh, Bujayan al Hatrum is a Saudi feminist who fought against male guardianship and also on behalf of women's right to drive, taken prisoner. And what happens a lot in, in Arabia is they are held prisoner and tortured by their own male relatives. Although in other cases, it may be the state, but that's kind of like the Roman thing where the men were supposed to discipline the women in their own families. So already we're seeing that speech and writing have been central to women's activism. And there are, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the women's movement that starts in the 1960s, because there is a growing realization out of the civil rights movement, the new left, the anti-war movement, of how a based woman's status really was in terms of leadership and public speech. And so you've got the paper Sex and Caste, 1965, uh, protesting the exclusion and subordination of women in SNCC and society. We have uh, 1967, a conference in Chicago. They formed a women's caucus, but they were prevented from presenting their divans, even though they were on the schedule. They rushed the stage. And the director patted Shulamith Firestone on the head and told her to cool it. We have more important things to talk about than women's problems. And Firestone is present also at this event, which really speaks volumes about why an autonomous women, women's movement was formed. 1969 anti-war uh, mob. Marilyn Webb is giving a very mild speech. Men in the audience begin to shout. They're the first women on stage. And they're talking about women's liberation. Take her off the stage and fuck her. All the while, she says, Shulia is on my right saying, keep going. Shulamith Firestone also tries to speak and is drowned out by sexual epithets. And so we have this outpouring of activism from women from many different cultural backgrounds. You have Black women. There's a very early piece here from Mary Ann Weathers arguing for Black women's liberation as a revolutionary force, 1969. We've got the Black Women's Manifesto, and I'm sure they're sure about the date on that there. Um, some activists that later become important leaders. Um, 
Eleanor Holmes Norton, for example. Women were taking over new left newspapers because the sexism was so bad and they had, you know, prostitution ads in the in the paper. Uh, goodbye to all that. You have uh, various publications, notes from the second year, off our backs. And there were a wide range, both these radical feminists and the lesbian feminists are not single issue feminists. They are talking also about racism, class oppression, military uh, imperialism, the wars that were going in the Vietnam wars going on at this time. We identify with all women. We define our best interest as that of the poorest, most brutally exploited women. And so there's legacies here, and I'm just not going to talk about all this. I'm just kind of like showing you there's a whole range of different women that were founding organizations and peace camps and uh, speaking out on violence against women, in some cases founding shelters, beginning publications. And this list could be much, much longer. That could be a whole, a whole show in itself. But just to show that this activism, a lot of people have lost sight of what the feminist movements were about and the range of issues that were being addressed by them and many cultural formations. But I'm going to skip over all that because I want to talk about backlash in the late 20th centuries. Um, uh, Brush Limbaugh, the right-wing radio talk host, introduced this term feminazi. So these kinds of epithets being wielded. This is an old, old story. In medieval Europe, it was witch and whore. But now we've got feminazi. And 30 years later, we're seeing self-styled anti-fascists bawling Nazi at feminists in uh, very intimidating, uh, geared up in like the black shirts of Mussolini, all in black with masks and balaclavas. And so we're seeing a continuation of, or even a revival of this history of silencing women. Because our right to name, define, and analyze our own reality is still being contested. And recently we've seen a resurgence of misogynist insults, threats, and punches somehow being defended as progressive. We've got a media that, def that still sympathizes with the witch hunters. That's the hero in this movie and glorification of violence against witches or like movies like The Exorcist where they're uh, demonically possessed. So these legacies were never digested in Western Civ and they are still in effect. So you've got the symbolism of burning women at the stake that comes up, a man who say no one is a bigger feminist than me as he burns the woman at a stake. And we see witch hunt means resurface in threats to women, particularly burning at the stake, uh, the executioner, medieval executioner, attacking a lesbian feminist who's sprawled on the floor of a dungeon, die in a fire, all of these kinds of epithets. And social acceptance has returned for sexist insults and aggression, rape threats, death threats against women, women as targets. And this is all passing as somehow being progressive, tortured, punching, and specifically punching for speech and beliefs. In this case, not only sexist, but also homophobic, very clear gender nonconforming woman is to be shown no mercy and to be deplatformed by this punching male fist. So what we've seen happen to silence women who dissent Doxing, threatening, stalking, mobbing, firing, banning, shunning, deplatforming, punching, sometimes breaking bones, censorship, silencing, expulsion, and exclusion in the name of inclusion. And this is an authoritarian aspect that has arisen under the banner of the left. And here we actually see a real jackboot stomping on cringing, cowering women one of whom is holding a sign saying, I had this coming. It's just pure thuggery. And this is not a one-off. Stop turfs, punch turfs. These are fascist methods of intimidation. And we have 
women's rights demonstrations and lesbian mar marches being attacked. This individual is notorious for their kill the turf t-shirt. And this photo, same person, has torn a banner away from the women who are marching and is trampling on the message that says, if we don't fight together, they're going to kill us all separately. And this is worthy of being trampled upon. Same here, lesbian strength, giving the finger and burning the poster. Burn the witches, attacking resistance lesbienne in Bordeaux a couple years ago. And so a lot of young men think that it's the cool thing to do for them to attack women. And you do see witch, 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 this, this person advancing with a walker and curling toward a woman, screaming witch. This woman had her skull concussed and her orbital bone broken by this beardo here who's attacking her, punched her multiple times. She's like 72. And she wanted to sit across the table from him and ask, what do you think you were doing? Why did you think it was okay to punch an old woman like that? So the question is, why are people who adjure that feminists should be kind, why are they ignoring death threats, rape threats, and sexist insults, the classic misogynist insults? Blaming women is a cultural habit, and this is part of the history of silencing women, because our right to name and define and analyze our own reality is still contested. We're still living in patriarchy. So this is only a few, there's a long roster of women who have been sued or fired or driven out from their jobs or subjected to character assassination, some cases physically attacked and driven out of groups they belong to. But we're getting hit by another direction. It's really a rock and a hard place because the authoritarian right is on the rise. And Christian nationalists want to reconstitute traditional patriarchy, barefoot and pregnant, male headship. They are banning abortion rights. They're going after contraception. They're planning to abolish. They've actually pledged to abolish Social Security and Medicare. And so this is something that's very dangerous, especially for uh, survival level for the economics of pregnancy and sexual harassment and whether you keep a job or not. And they advocate fundamentalist fascism. These are totalitarian goals by big pocket fundamentalist organizations who have historically opposed women's rights. And they're very eager to exploit wedge issues in the current one is the trans issue. So you've got these groups, Alliance Defending Freedom, Fundamentalists, Concerned Women for America, Anti-Women's Rights, with a history of that, Heritage Foundation, which has a new totalitarian plan for an imperial presidency in 2025, Independent Women's Forum, who has historically argued against women's rights, who actually militated against what they called victim fem feminism. So this far right political movement really wants to run a fascist Gilead upon us. And this is not a very well-known group, the Council for National Policy, but there's a consortium of allied organizations that are basically Christo-fascist. And there is no bomb in Gilead, not for women and not from these men. They believe in male headship, and women are to submit, to be quiet, to be on their knees, to be at their home. And there are women in these organizations who sign on with this. My husband doesn't want me to vote. And I'm relieved because I think only men should have these rights. I'm a surrendered wife. So this is something that's very widespread and growing. They're starting to drive women out of the ministries that they have fought their way into in some of the Protestant churches, uh, notably the Southern Baptists that just did this. And also we see right-wingers attacking uh, liberals like the um, Julia Gillard in the Australian uh, parliament, the prime minister, she gave her misogyny speech. Uh, here you see them uh, calling her 
bitch and ditch the witch. So again, the witch hunt, the symbolism is being invoked. We've seen this from, from the far left and the far right of both. Uh, and, and she spoke up and really changed the landscape in some ways for Australian women by fighting back against it and confronting it directly. So we've got attacks on our rights from our historic enemies on the right and the, the anti-abortion terrorism isn't over yet, but also from regressive progressives on the left who want to ban and silence women. But the Scottish slogan, women won't wished, means we're not going to shut up. We're not going to be silenced. And the speak out is happening. You cannot silence women. They're rising up all over the planet against male violence, against patriarchy, the demonstrations to get justice for the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, the femicide, which is going on all over the world, very high levels in Mexico and Central America. We demand justice and an end to impunity. This is one of the through lines of all the violence I've been talking about here is impunity. You can break a woman's skull and get community service for it. Here's the Koreans. Angry women will change the world. We do not have to stay silent. If the Afghan women can say that, we better get it together too. You know, they're under very dire circumstances of, of sexual apartheid. On the rise up of the women in Iran, women, life, freedom, girls, school, school girls here dancing and shot, singing, Azadi, Azadi, freedom, freedom. So this presentation, I was going to originally include in it images of and stories of women fighting back, women's speech against oppression of all kinds, but it would be too long. So I'm going to have another uh, upload that's coming within a month or so on women speak, women speaking, women's writing that addresses that. It's purely for reasons of length. And so that's what I've got for you today. More to come.